I would like to just briefly acknowledge um, Adrian Moritz, who unfortunately passed away just a couple of weeks ago. He was a very valued colleague of us, of ours. He was on our he's been on our committee um, and will be sadly, sadly missed, not just by the ATSI community, but especially by the engineering community at RMIT and uh, and more broadly across our um, our, the friendships and the collaboration that we've had with Adrian. So uh, we uh, we really would like to commemorate and acknowledge the, the contribution he's made and acknowledge his passing. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners um, of the land on which this event is taking place, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay our respect to their elders past and present and their families. Uh, I'd also like to add my support and the support of my colleagues that I've spoken with to the recognition of our First Nations and the establishment of the voice within the Australian Constitution uh, through the referendum later this year. So, um, moving over here. <laughs> um, as, you, as you would have seen, establishing and maintaining um, a place at the forefront of international collaborative research and innovation is a bold ambition for any nation. Um, it depends on many things, not least the intellectual capacity. Uh, to do the research and the sustained funding to support the researchers. But critically, um, especially as we strive to address more complex, cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary research challenges, um, and to translate that research into sort of practical, <clears throat> socio-economically valuable outcomes for Australia, um, access to the appropriate suite of research infrastructure um, and knowledge infrastructure is key. Uh, infrastructure that will attract, motivate, um, and enable effective collaboration across disciplines, across institutions, and between academia and other institutions and industry uh, is really important. So tonight we're going to hear about uh, four quite different research and knowledge infrastructures, varying in size, scale, focus, funding, governance, etc., um, we'll have some introductory comments from each of the, uh, the four presenters, and then we'll have um, a bit of Q&A to perhaps draw out further some of the challenges uh, and opportunities that they face, some of the obstacles to collaboration, some of the uh, areas, uh, obstacles also to research translation, uh, industry academic collaboration, innovation, how to involve government perhaps, and also the international connectivity that we need to really make it work. <clears throat> So uh, in terms of the order of the presentation, I'll, I'll, I'll just go through that now and rather than disrupt it as we, as we go through. So we're going to start off with the newest infrastructure, which actually isn't quite working yet. <laughs> and that's me talking about the Stored Underground Physics Laboratory, uh, one of the many um, interests that I've got involved in in my retirement is, is chairing this facility. Um, and so we'll talk a bit about that. We'll then have um, Stu Cannon, um, over there, who, who's the program leader of the Maritime Surface and Above Water Combat Group um, at uh, DSTG. We'll be talking about some of their infrastructures. Unfortunately, our third speaker, um, who was scheduled to be here, uh, Mike James, is unwell, uh, not COVID, another virus, um, but we're pleased to have Peter Kappen filling in at the last minute. So thank you, Peter, for being here. Peter leads the um, spectroscopy group of beam lines at the Australian Synchrotron, uh, which is part of ANSTO. Um, he, he joined the Synchrotron in 2012 um, after coordinating the Synchrotron program at La Trobe University. Um, had the benefit of a three month secondment in government, um, looking at innovation, the Australian innovation landscape, which hopefully will inform the discussion here as well. And he's enjoyed through his career driving collaboration uh, with industry partners across government and research. And so all of that will, will, I think, factor into the discussion tonight. And our third, our fourth speaker, again, I'm not giving, giving the bios of the ones you've heard from before because they're in the notes, but our fourth one is Rosie Hicks, who's the CEO of the Australian Research Data Commons. So four quite different infrastructures that they'll speak to. So uh, each of us will provide a short overview and then we'll have a bit of a, a Q and A, an opportunity for some questions from the audience. Those online as well, if you'd like to submit questions through the, um, the Q&A link, uh, we'll try and get to those as well. So, all right, so we'll kick off with me. So, as I said, um, <clears throat> SUPL, the Straw Underground, Straw Underground Physics Laboratory, is the newest of the infrastructures we'll talk about. And it's still 
at the final stage of its construction um, and its defect rectified. Uh, What's the pronoun for rectified? Yeah, that. that. <laughs> Uh, so we're going through that. I shouldn't have had that wine, I know. Um, so we've established a company to operate it, and that's the that's Supple Limited. And I chair, I'm the independent chair of that company, and I'll come to the the members of that sort of towards the end. Um, so the, uh, the the company that's been established is to operate the facility, not to do the science. We we will, um, I guess, facilitate the science, and through our science and our scientific research committee. Uh, make a call on what science we actually will accommodate and, and how that will be done. But initially, most of the science will be delivered through the Centre of Excellence for Dark Matter Particle Physics, through ANSTO, and progressively through other institutions as we get more established and move forward. Um, where's the... <laughs> Thanks very much. So, um, so we are literally underground, as the name suggests. We're underground in the store gold mine. And I think if I follow this here, this is the store gold mine, which is uh, like all gold mines, a something that looks like it sort of has been around for a hundred years. Um, it hasn't, but they are the sort of places that have very marginal investment in infrastructure beyond what they might need for the next two years. Because the life of most gold mines is governed by the price of gold and they don't plan very much beyond the next two years. So that in itself is a, is a factor in, uh, in our research infrastructure. So basically where we're located is down that hole there, which is in here. So you, you turn left at the, the only set of traffic lights in store um, and head down that hole to get to where we are. Um, recently, um, clearly the gold mining industry is probably one of the most regulated industries in Australia. It's taken them 10 years and just recently to get approval for actually lifting the height of their tailing storage facility by three and a half metres through to go through the environmental profile to get that. But that, in fact, is quite an important outcome for us because it does help in the longevity of, their, their, um, of the gold mine. So the um, when... The whole concept of an underground gold mine started with a bunch of scientists back in about 2014 saying we really need to have somewhere underground that we can get away from surface radiation to look for signals of dark matter from, from space. And uh, fortuitously at the time, the gold mine had actually closed, um, the price of gold being what it was at the time, and the local council was looking for alternative uses for the facilities underground. And... Uh, quite, I don't know quite how it happened, but the scientists from Swinburne and ANU at the time and Melbourne at the time got together with the local council, approached the mine, and they agreed that they would explore the opportunity of going underground. Nothing happened for a few years. The mine new owners took over the mine, and they are very very keen to be involved in in the um, the idea of actually establishing a laboratory down there. So the um, uh, the, the mine itself were very active in um, really helping to make sure to, to, to do the excavation that was needed to, to sort of hollow out the tunnel. We're down a part in a part of the mine that's no longer used. However, the top part of the tunnel is still used. So it's, in that, it's an eight kilometre drive to get down from the surface to one kilometre underground. There's no such thing as a lift. Uh, and for about half of that, we share the road with things like this, which are trucks carrying 50 tons of rock and on that 50 tons of rock there's about one to two teaspoons of gold so that's how fragile the gold industry is uh 20 on current prices roughly 20 ton a 20 gram kilogram gold bar is about um 1.2 million dollars so um that's the that's sort of that's where the industry is is, is occupied is is working at the moment so we we exist very much at the at the pleasure of the gold mine they're very enthusiastic and very much part of what we're doing. So they're a partner that we're working very closely with. So down in the laboratory, the actual um, the actual lab laboratory space is is as mapped out here. Um, the premier the premier experiment that we're going to be launching is the um, the dark matter search. It's an instrument called Sabre, sodium iodide with active background rejection. Basically, it's looking. This is the the in, in innards of it. 
And what it's doing is looking for dark matter from space. Now, from I'm not going to give you a lecture on science. We can pick that up over dinner <laughs> if we get to that. And, and I noticed Virginia has turned up, so she, she can help with the explanations. Um, basically, what, we're, what, what the theory is, is that if you look at the way the, the universe um, behaves, how stars uh, rotate around galaxies and how galaxies form and, op and, and move, um, if you went by the existing um, mass that you can see, you just couldn't explain it happening. In order to explain the movement of stars around galaxies, you've got to theorise that there's 85% more mass there than you can actually see. And that's the theory behind um, the, the hunt for dark matter. There have been something like 50 experiments to date that have actually looked for and failed to find dark matter, but there is one that has actually found it uh, or thinks they've found it. And that is a, a that's in the um, a, uh, Dharma Libra in, in Italy. Um, and they, they have found what they think is a signal for dark matter from space. Um, however, um, it also could be, mis it's not unequivocal. It could also be interpreted as um, a seasonal effect. Um, it peaks in June. And it, it's at a minimum in November, as they say, it could be the number of tourists in Italy, it could be the amount of snow on the ground. The only way to really eliminate those is to look in the southern hemisphere. And if we get the same signal down here, hey presto, we well, um, we hope. <laughs> we do a few more tests perhaps. But anyway, that's that's that, that's the if and only if. Um, if we don't get that signal, then clearly we're not confirming it. Um, and so there was a big emphasis on actually building that facility here in the Southern Hemisphere. So what, what our laboratory offer, offers is a, um, a unique radiation quiet environment. We're down a kilometre below the surface so that we can get away from the cosmic rays at the surface um, and provide this facility. So the initial experiment that we'll be running is the SABRE experiment, the dark matter experiment. But there are a lot of other experiments that will take advantage of a radiation-free environment, well, ra low radiation environment, and also a geologically stable environment. So we're looking at geological type experiments as well. So already some of the things that um, are being explored as potential future applications are around um, other elements of neutrino nuclear astrophysics, quantum computing, quantum devices, there's biological experiments and cancer research. So there are opportunities. There's a in the laboratory at Dharma Libra in Italy, Flinders University have been involved already in doing research on cancer drugs. So there's obviously opportunities there as well. So we're looking at much bright, broader applications in the future. Uh, so just briefly, some of the challenges and opportunities that we're facing um, is that um, it is highly valued by the local community. They're very keen to be involved in seeing a long life or the mine, but also attracting people to the to the region in terms of um, you know what it might offer. But very a lot of interest in STEM um, and STEM opportunities. We're looking at an outreach center potentially there, and also how you can reuse mining infrastructure. That's very important to them. Um, so in, internationally, it's a draw card because we are the only labor underground laboratory in the Southern Hemisphere. So we're looking at potential for um, engagement and um, collaboration internationally. Um, and certainly in terms of innovation, uh, the science itself is very much a, um, I guess, theoretical science, but a lot of the work that we're doing will have downstream impacts. The technology that's being used, there are a lot of opportunities for innovation on the dark matter side of things. But particularly once we start looking at things like quantum computing, biological experiments, there's a lot more opportunities there for practical applications um, across a wide range of sciences. I'm trying to think of another word for P that doesn't, step, that doesn't mean physics. So we can keep supple in the name, but drop the physics as much as I love physics. Um, we have a very close engagement with the mine itself in terms of our operation and access. It's a highly regulated environment. Nobody goes down without being fully inducted, without mm -hmm. wearing hard hats, high vis, uh, breathing apparatus. Um, when they say get out, you get out. You do not hesitate. And so we need to be very much be aligned with that. Um, the, uh, the, the our initial funding, um, I stole a word, stole a couple of words from Rosie. There, planned serendipity. Um, it, it just happened. They 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 were in the right place at the right time. Got ten million dollars, five millions out of the feds, five million out of the Victorian government. Needed a couple more from Melbourne University. So the total build, pretty much, they had a business case there, but it was just really good timing to get money to actually build it. 
Operating it on the long term is a hard challenge. We have five members that are chipping in some money each year, but we still really don't know how much it's going to cost. Um, and so we will be looking you know, towards the government and towards other opportunities to get the funding we need to operate it in the long term. So just last slide here for me. So as I said, the capital funding came from the Victorian government and the state government. We work, re the, 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 the gold mine itself has put a lot of in-kind investment in, in terms of people, in terms of the work that they've done, and they continue to support us very strongly. Northern Grampian Shire Council, very, very keen to be engaged. And also both of these are very keen to be part of an outreach proposal we're looking to develop. Our initial members are these um, five, University of Adelaide, ANU, Anstow, Melbourne, and Swinburne. We're in discussion with a couple of other universities, hopefully, that might join in. And we have our, our main research partner is the Centre of Excellence, but that will increase as we go forward, and the um, observatory in Italy at Dama Libra, at um, Gran Sasso in Italy. So that's that's our story. Um, I'm going to pass over to Stu now. You to switch that before I switch that. Oh, thank you. So, in oh, contrast, yeah. I'm going to talk about some facilities that we've um, used yep, that's right. over a number of years. Um, yep, and demonstrate um, what's worked for us in terms of calibra um, collaboration and, and what hasn't. And then um, finally, just to keep up with Sue. I'd give her another use for a gold mine yeah. at the end of the presentation. <laughs> okay, so hydrodynamic facilities. Um, within the um, Department of Defence, so obviously we have a, a great use for a lot of hydrodynamic test facilities. We also have um, the ability to collaborate with our international partners, in particular the US, the UK, um, as well as regional engagement in um, Singapore and Japan. So um, a lot of the facilities that we support here complement those facilities overseas. And um, in this particular example, which is the tow tank down at the Australian Maritime College, which is the laser up here, um, what you really want to notice here is the length of the, um, of the tow tank is only 100 metres long compared to this facility that we have access to at Carter Rock in the US, um, where it's 845 metres long. That's so long that the rails along the edge of the um, tow tank are actually curved to the shape of the earth, so that gravity acts down all the way along the length of the um, tow tank. Um, but when you get a facility that size, the cost of the experiments are huge, the cost of the models are huge. So here in Australia, we use the small tow tank to look at concepts for the um, modeling and testing. So here I've got um, a supply ship and a frigate operating side by side um, for replenishment at sea. And um, we can develop the experiment, see how it works, test our modeling before we go and use a much larger facility to um, verify, um, you know, in, in in, in the real world. So smaller facilities allow us to do a lot of trial experimentation. Similarly, down at the Maritime College, there's an ocean wave basin. And again, um, you can see in, in the figure there, comparisons to the wave basin that's at Carter Rock. And the last one underneath the um, um, image is um, details of a brand new tank that's just been built in um, Singapore. So again, you can see our facilities are relatively small, but we support this facility because it is dual use and multi-use. And so this thing here is one of these um, um, designs of a, of a surfing pool so that um, these rotate and a wave is generated and surfers can continue to surf. It's used for um, energy, um, collection for um, offshore, um, but we can use it um, for a number of um, activities. And here you can see, um, this is the LHD, um, the landing helicopter dock ship, and there's a little landing craft in the back. And um, when we were going through the acquisition of this particular project, the army changed their landing craft, and we needed to understand whether there was a technical risk 
or not. And um, we built the models very, very quickly. A great relationship with the Maritime College meant that I could go down there and stop them doing their academic research because I had a short-term defense need. So that brings in, with the facilities, you need the culture of the academics or the workers in the facility to understand the needs of, a, of, of the government, of defence, and we need an answer straight away rather than long-term R&D activities. So having a small facility is great. The other thing about this facility that complements um, perhaps what we do with the UK is um, those big facilities in Carterock and Singapore have a, have a, a thing that I call structural water. That is, you can't take the water out, um, or else the size of the tanks might fall in. Um, but down in Tasmania, we can empty the tank. We can go to very, very shallow water, so we can look at the influence of bottom um, on, on on the motions of ships and things like that. So a small facility is 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 absolutely great. Next facility, again, where Sue used the word um, unique, I'm using the word unique here with the cavitation tunnel down at um, the Maritime College. And again, um, the comparison here is with um, a similar facility in um, Japan. The test section at the Maritime College here is um, 0.6 of a metre by 0.6 of a metre by 2.6 metres long, whereas in uh, Japan, it's two metres by two metres by 10 metres. That's about the size of our wind tunnel at, um, at DSTG. Um, the unique thing about this facility, though, is that we can um, grow um, a known size and distribution of nuclei in the water. So it's unique. It's the only one in the world that we can do that. It's great for the scientists to understand the, um, the, the fluid mechanics that's going on. But for somebody like me, the influence of water quality may affect the speed that I'm looking for submarines. And if I operate my ship above that speed, then the submarine will find me straight away, and that's not a good outcome. Um, so, so long as we've got access to these big facilities, then scaling and things like that can be addressed, and um, we can um, address our, our problems. The other thing that we've done down at the Maritime College that is very important for defence is we've got... Um, a scalable um, security boundary around the system. So the academics can use the facilities. They can have their, I'll say, foreign PhD students um, from all over the world working on it. We can go down there, take over the um, cavitation tunnel. Our staff are trained to use it. We change the locks on the doors um, and, and we put a secure facility around. If we're testing a propeller that's um, that, that is classified. We've also got access to our defense secret network down there. So we can store the data that we collect. We can process the data down there before we send it back. So having a culture of, um, or having research facilities that allow this change in security um, is, is, is very, very important for us in defense. The last facility of what to do with another gold mine, and um, this is um, out in um, Nagambi. This facility out here is an open cut gold mine as opposed to a deep hole in the ground. Um, we used to have an underwater shock facility in Epping in the north of, of Melbourne, but suburbia grew around it, and I think kids went swimming in it every day, and we spent all week um, cleaning it up. But this is um, a new facility that we've. Um, um, we have, it's an old open cut mine. And um, like Sue suggested, there's a road that goes um, um, to this site and the trucks go past as well. And they don't stop for you either. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so this um, facility you can see here is about 80 meters long. Um, I, I think it's about 40 meters wide. It's, it's, it's about 80 meters deep as well. Um, we've built the infrastructure to have um, the IT networks, um, you know, facilities, uh, lecture rooms in here. Um, they're, they're all in here. Um, there's a facility to the side of it here, which is um, uh, lined with a swimming pool liner and there's clean water in there. So scientists can go in and look at um, 
you know, the, the mechanics of bubble formations, it's 100% crystal clear. Um, as you come um, to this side, this is a, a an actual underwater um, explosive that, that, that's gone off. Um, probably about three weeks ago, um, a company called Thornton Tomasetti um, delivered a floating barge into this area. And previously I spoke about the use of air guns and air gun te technology for shock testing. Um, we've got an air gun array under there so that we can do commercial testing of, um, of equipment that goes on board ships and submarines. And that's about qualification. And so the exactness of the science is not as good. If I want a piece of equipment to withstand, say, 10G under that type of experiment, I'll get somewhere between nine and a half and 11 and a half G, and that's good enough for shock qualification. But those limits are probably not good um, for science. Um, so it's a joint facility. Um, Kinetic are running it for us on behalf of um, the Department of Defense. And some of the infrastructure is provided by a private company, Thornton Tomasetti, to do these underwater explosives. But other people are talking to us about using it for measuring um, acoustic and magnetic signatures of platforms. Um, the defense, diver training, and police are also looking at the facility. Um, so it is completely multiple use um, of, a, of a new mine. So I'll just summarize with, um, with those points. It's, it's very important that we, um, we have all the aspects of capability. So it's the staff culture, a supply chain of um, STEM workforces, um, Sue mentioned. Uniqueness in new niche areas such as scale and capability is important. Flexible security boundaries are obviously very important. Dual use, accessible to everybody, and it's got to be affordable for both purchasing as well as running at the end of the day. So there are our facilities. I'm going to hand over to... Peter. Peter. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, yeah, I'm probably too tall. I don't think I'll fit into the frame. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. Um, thank you very much. Um, I was going to open by saying, well, we're talking about another piece of large scale in research infrastructure, but having seen an 800 meter tow tank and this only being in a 110 meter across building, I'm not entirely sure anymore about that. <laughs> but um, still, when you step inside, it still feels cavernous and large. So the Australian synchrotron, and just for a bit of context, the synchrotron sits in a precinct um, that contains academia, research, R&D, industry, uh, and these sorts of things. And that makes sense for a synchrotron. Synchrotrons around the world have a habit and the tendency of sitting in precincts because you get porosity, you get exchange. And so that always makes good sense. And we like that kind of aspect of, of the Australian synchrotron as well. It doesn't say anything about accessing the facility though. Um, access um, is available to anyone and there's no exclusive rights um, to our, so the, 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 the accessibility doesn't scale with distance from the front door. That's what, that's what I should say. Um, but I'll come back to that um, also in, a, in a second. On the inside, the synchrotron is just a particle accelerator um, that creates intense beams of light synchrotron light, um, x-rays and infrared light. And we funnel that sort of that light that we generate down pipes and we call these pipes beamlines. And I'll probably say the word beamline more than once uh, again. So uh, beamline is kind of just a catchphrase, catch-all phrase for a thing that funnels light to what we call an end station. And then usually we mix it all up and say the, the whole thing is called a beamline. Um, but just suffice to say, a beamline is basically an instrument. It's just the, the instrument is the size of a small house, but otherwise it's just an instrument. So um, at a glance, the synchrotron is a reasonably busy place. Uh, we are connected to thousands of people. We run about a thousand or so, or support about a thousand or so experiments per, per annum. 
Uh, we operate pretty much 24 hours every day, almost seven days a week. So that's why there's a quotation mark around that. But when you come to the synchrotron and you get access, you get access for blocks of time. And it's usually in quantities of, usually it's in quantities of 24 hours. So there's a lot going on um, in, in terms of input parameters into, this, into the synchrotron. And in terms of output parameters, um, that busyness um, reflects in the number of applications and the number of protein structures submitted to the data bank. Uh, and um, it also reflects in what I like to like to think of um, touching the careers uh, and the success of early career researchers and scientists. So through our work, uh, we've supported one way or another um, around about um, 150 uh, or we're sort of supporting around about 150 theses um, of some description. Um, so there, uh, there, there is a fair bit going on. And when we're talking about infrastructure of this sort of scale, it's, it's really important to also uh, keep the lights on and have funding for refurbishment. So that is a key part for us. And we're very grateful that we do have funding that helps us refurbish and maintain the place but also um, that we could secure funding for what we call the BRIGHT program. And the BRIGHT program is shorthand for building mobile lines. So extending our capabilities in order to be internationally and remain internationally competitive. And the BRIGHT program is a program of partnerships. And this is the important point. It's, we've, throughout the history of the synchrotron, we've pretty much always been funded and supported through partnerships, through our partners uh, and people who um, want us to be there. So the, the BRIGHT program itself, uh, the capital part of the BRIGHT program was um, funded by a whole range of partner, uh, partners, um, including New Zealand and the Commonwealth is chipping in, in this case, through operational funding for those eight new V lines. So 10 beam lines on the floor, we're building eight new, uh, um, eight new ones. Some of them are already in the early phases of operations, others will come online, and uh, we're looking to complete the whole program in a couple of years time, by 2025. So partnerships, uh, keep that in mind, partnerships is really important. But bringing this back, so what does that mean day to day? Ultimately, we are a user facility. So we're here to help the visiting researchers and industry clients to do things that they cannot do otherwise um, using laboratory or other techniques. And as I mentioned earlier, experiments might run just from a few hours um, up to a few days. And a few days that means a um, few days times 24 hours all in a row. So you work up with a small team of people and we'll support you. Uh, we'll give you accommodation in our guest house, for example, such that you can um, have a healthy experience and you uh, go away not only with a good experience and good data, but also uh, in, in good spirits and good health. When it comes to data, some of these beamlines, end stations, instruments can support high throughput, thousands of samples sometimes um, in a day. That creates lots of data. So, um, and when we're, to when we're talking lots of data, sometimes it's just gigabytes per hour, that's not a, a lot. And um, sometimes it's terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data per hour. So research data curation, providing tools for people to not only collect the data, but also analyze and curate the data uh, is a pretty important um, part for large scale facilities like this. And um, I'm sure um, Rosie will be talking more about uh, national scale um, data curation and these sorts of things. So um, ultimately, all of that is only possible with people. And about half of our staff are really engaged in the day-to-day -day operational business of supporting visiting researchers and industry clients. The other half are engaged in the developmental aspects and building new capacities and instruments and capabilities. So people are, people are at the center of it all, really. What can we do? I'll, I'm not going to go into much detail other than saying, um, if you've got a research problem, um, the synchrotron may very well be able to help you. 
So whether it's improving uh, the environment through looking into how contaminants interact with natural systems, and how to remediate uh, contaminated sites, whether it's in and around uh, discovering new drugs and pharmaceuticals to improve our lives, or whether it's developing newer and better and higher capacity batteries for consumer products or cars. Ultimately, the synchrotron can help with any well, any of anything pretty much. It's a big statement, but um, there's probably only very few things that we can't help with. Um, I suppose um, cosmology and particle detection is probably not our forte, but that's what we've got support for. So um, yeah, any of these things, pretty much. So it's quite exhilarating when you work at the synchrotron and you uh, are embedded in this multidisciplinary space where you can talk to someone who's there and they do something completely new and something completely different that you've never heard of and you learn something new every day. That is really cool, actually. And um, final slide from me as well, a look into the future. Um, I mentioned earlier international competitiveness and international competitive or and competitiveness also um, has to do with upgrading facilities. So we've been operating for about 15 years. We'll have another 15 years ahead of us. And then the infrastructure just needs updating. And it needs updating not only because it's just much harder to keep old things, pieces of kit and equipment going, but also technology is moving on and the world is moving on. Right now, a number of countries are building next generation synchrotron facilities where the brightness of the, of the beam um, produces orders of magnitude greater than what we can do in Australia or at other comparable facilities around the world. So we are thinking about what do we need to do, what is the concept and the business, um, the business case for a new synchrotron, a next generation um, facility. And we are also quite mindful that we're the only synchrotron. In, in Australia, and the next synchrotron is at least seven hours or eight hours by plane away. So we don't want to run into the problem where we have to shut down the current facility, which might be converted into a big water tank, I don't know, um, <laughs> and then end up with a capability hole on the national scale before we have the next one online. So we have to have some overlap and get these things continuously going. And um, yeah. With that, I shall um, hand over to Rosie. Thank you very much. Good, good, lovely. All right. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. I am Rosie Hicks. I'm the CEO of the Australian Research Data Commons, which is one of the federal government's NCRIS facilities, National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. And our mission is to accelerate research and innovation. So I think I'm in the right spot by driving excellence in the creation, analysis and retention of high quality data assets. I'm going to pause to acknowledge the first Australians uh, on whose traditional lands we're meeting this evening and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. We have heard some fantastic stories of physical research infrastructure. Um, I spent nearly 12 years as a neighbour to the Australian synchrotron in my former role as uh, the lead for the Australian National Fabrication Facility. And of course, many familiar faces in the room for me this evening from, from those years. Um, I haven't been down any gold mines yet, but I am looking forward to it, Sue. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, so that's the first difference looking at digital research infrastructure. This is our asset, the team. But what I'm going to be mentioning over the next couple of minutes is not only how this research infrastructure is a catalyst for collaboration and innovation, but indeed it is imperative 
that we have national scale collaboration for digital research infrastructure. What I'm going to do is I'm going, this is my one text heavy side. I'm going to introduce a particular definition of knowledge infrastructure. And this, this, is, this is the key part here. So I'm gonna spend a moment. We're looking at shared scientific data, assets and resources. We're looking at collections, repositories and archives. Previous speakers have touched on some of these things. Uh, security, transfer rates, curation, storage. We need to think about the standards, the protocols, and the services that underpin the integration and sharing and reuse of data. We're thinking about the algorithms, uh, the platforms that we use that are so critical for transforming data into knowledge and discoveries, and critically, the human capital sits here at the end. But this leads us to the second difference. We can't see these things and we're rubbish at looking after them. All right, that's what we need to change. <clears throat> Historically, Digital research infrastructure has been adopted by those at the bleeding edge, at the frontier. And there was a time where it was absolutely appropriate to have a thousand flowers blooming. Now, it's mainstream, it's underpinning, and we have to shift the way that we think about this. Our strategy at the ARDC is putting the researcher at the center and working through a co-design process to develop national digital research infrastructure that we can then continue to support, maintain and enhance for many years to come, rather than the system that we've had for the last few years, which has been very competitive, it has had a lot of unmet needs, and it has had duplication as well. So we call this our thematic research data commons, and we've chosen three areas in which to start this work. The first is called people. We're looking at health and medical research data. The next, no surprises, it's called planet. We're looking at environment and climate science. And the final one of our initial set of three is the humanities, arts, social sciences, and indigenous capability. So that's our strategy going forward at a very uh, rapid fly through, drilling down a bit more and looking at the people example. The stakeholders, the users of this data, the researchers, the private sector, the innovators, the policy makers, they all have needs from um, our medical uh, data here in Australia. We spent a lot of time working with those communities to understand those needs and identified four key data challenges to start with. Secure research environments, being able to find the data, the advanced analytics, and then critically the integration of data from many different sources. But look, this is the health system the complexity, the number of partners, the sensitivity of the data. How do we link the results of NH and MRC funded cohort trials with the Illawarra health system to really get the best results from our research? That's the high level looking at the system view. Uh, I'm going to use the planet example to take it down to the next level. So here again, extensive consultation with the community enabled us to identify top data challenges. Um, the top three, I would say, and it, because it's shown very nicely on this slide, uh, that all of our consultations identified the need for data to follow the FAIR and CARE principles. If you don't uh, have those rolling off the tip of your tongue, we're talking about data that's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And with care, we're looking at collective benefit, authority to act, responsibility, and ethics. So those are underpinning principles, uh, but again, we need them 
We need trusted data supply chains. We need curated, integrated data assets and services. And we need the modeling and decision support infrastructure so that we can integrate the data to provide solutions for agriculture, for biosecurity, and for other applications. What we don't want is every one of these data custodians, research institutions, industry, <clears throat> government, other increased capabilities to make a bespoke solution to address many different application areas. So what we're looking at now is building national reference architecture that not only can we use in the planet research data commons, but then we can transfer uh, across to people and across to HASS and indigenous capability. So we have our three, the people, planet and HASS and indigenous capability. And particularly for this audience, I have to say that we have just submitted um, an application to the federal government for an engineering innovation research data commons. I mean, you, you of all people need that, don't you? Uh, great, so good. And we are going to be using these to create world leading knowledge infrastructure so that Australian researchers can transform our lives. And I think I've stuck to my time. There you go. <laughs> Peter, thanks. Thank you very much. You all did a very good job. Um, and um, at, at really outlining the, the, now how are we going microphone wise? Can will this pick up our speak our speakers? Um, so we're going to have a bit of QA. I'm, I'm just going to kick it off, but then I'll open up to questions online and also from the audience here. Um, and I, I guess I guess you know one of the things that's come out very strongly um, is, is is data. Absolutely, data is critical to to enable the research to actually happen and to facilitate the collaboration. So. Um, I, I guess maybe maybe Rosie just jumping on that. What what are some of the risks and barriers that that, that, that you're ident that you've come across to effective collaboration? Um, is it really the, just that establishing that common language around data, or is there a bigger conversation that needs to be had to actually get collaboration active? There are many levels there. Um, some of them are technical. Those are the easy ones. Yeah. Uh, standards, protocols, you know, they are easy compared to getting people to follow them. Uh, so I think there's very much the social um, aspect of getting this to be recognized as a preferred outcome mm. uh, that we that we need to ensure that the power that there isn't this feeling that ownership of data is the strength. Um, I think it's a good time to share a figure. The, the EU has done some work that identifies the annual cost of not having fair data to be 10.2 billion euros per year. Now, with that kind of understanding, mm. being able to persuade people, I think, is, is ultimately a critical part of the argument. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, the other um, panelists, any any other sort of particular barriers that 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 come out through your through your experience? No, I think Rose has yeah covered it really well. It's um, the the challenge that we have is is the longevity in keeping that data in the system that we constantly access it, mm -hmm. and we don't have to revisit, um, redo the experiments mm -hmm. um, to to relearn what we learned a long time ago. Um, and I, I see that as one of our biggest challenges is yeah. keeping the one back. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, ultimately data needs to be stored somewhere. Um, there's usually a price tag att uh, attached to data storage as well. Uh, and you need to make some decisions, somewhere you need to make some decisions as to whether you upgrade your storage facilities or whether you work with a community to say, well, this data has a certain, does the data have a lifespan? Yeah. Is, there, is there a natural endpoint to these 15 petabytes of data? And do you need, will you need them? 
And uh, I mean, I suppose we are sort of, we're probably, we probably tend to say, yes, I want to keep my data um, in perpetuity. <laughs> and that's a fair, that's not an unfair point. Uh, and then the conversation gets interesting about, okay, how can we support a reasonable data retention? Or should we follow models that are perhaps um, are more overseas uh, inspired and go, we are going to retain all the data, always? Yeah. I don't know. Oh, don't, don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm open to oh, No, really. I, can I just, may I? Yes, please. So I think this is something that we're just not talking about enough. So yes. thank you, Peter. It was a really good conversation. Um, historically, the response has been to buy more storage. What we're trying to do now is to change the conversation from a conversation about storage to a conversation about data retention. Mm -hmm. Do you know what you're storing? Can you find it? Can you access it? Can you use it again? Is it worth the value of storing it? And the, the this is a conversation that the ARDC has been working through with the institutions and others in the, the current funding cycle. Mm. And what we've found is that to retrofit the information, the metadata that's re required to make those decisions is nigh on impossible. You, you can't go back and tidy these things up. Mm. So what we need to do moving forward, and I'm, so I'm not solving the historical problem, mm. but what we need to be doing going forward is being much more considered mm. about how we capture fair data yeah. so down in in underground facilities is the facility with the ph it might help supple yeah yeah yeah, um, right. yeah. are we capturing fair data yeah yeah mm -hmm. thanks for that and and look just moving a bit back into the more the physical elements of the infrastructure um well infrastructure as a whole um you know one, one of the one of the goals of you know, research increase and research funding in australia is to actually enable research that actually will deliver value to Australia down, down the line. So, and one pathway, a critical pathway to that is the effective collaboration between academia and business. Um, what, uh, you know, maybe Peter, you know, what are some of the things that we can do to actually really enable much more effective collaboration um, at, the at the infrastructure level that will enable more effective translation down the line? Yeah, yeah. Maybe we should have, uh, I'll start the, uh, I'll start answering the question by recognizing that that we over the last few years, my sense is we've gotten better at it. So we're not oh, cool. somewhere <laughs> we're not somewhere in the dark ages yeah. where it comes to con connecting and meaningfully interacting and working with uh, with industry and and vice versa. Yeah. Ultimately, I think there's there, there are a few elements to this. Um, people and partnerships. And where, where we come to people, there is still probably a piece of work about aligning our mindsets mm -hmm. to, to working together. So if I'm a, a researcher and, uh, or I am someone working in business and I want to work with the other party, researcher or business, <laughs> the other way around, then there is, the, 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 there is something about aligning our mindsets that we want to create value for each other, which is an innovation mindset. And we want to, to work together to actually do something that's meaningful. And that's meaningful for both parties. Um, at an institutional level, that means that, that means that individual people have to have their KPIs aligned accordingly. To, to promote these sorts of things, to promote uh, promoting working with industry, for example, as uh, from from a research uh, point of view, infrastructure plays a key role. Um, infrastructure can be hugely enabled for for really high powered investigations and analyses, and there is also this there there is this communication piece about sort of selling our infrastructure and our capabilities and our, whether it's small scale infrastructure or big scale infrastructure, selling those, those capabilities to industry and business as well and making it attractive 
So I don't want to put the onus only on, on industry or on government, which brings us to policy settings. So we mm -hmm. do need foreseeable and long-term stable policy settings. It's really important for businesses to, to, to have planning security and ultimately for us in science, it's equally important. So we can forge longer term relationships and longer term plans uh, and direct investment. Mm -hmm. I'm quite a fan of direct investment into programs, mm -hmm. um, CRCs, for example. I've got, I've got a soft spot for CRCs because they bring people together really meaningfully. Yes. So this is, there, there's a whole bunch of things where we can work okay. and improve and that's irrespective of whether it's large scale infrastructure or at an institutional level. Thank, thanks for that. I'm going to throw one more question just to Stu and then open it up. So if anyone else has got their questions, please bring them forward. So Stuart, what, what, one of the, um, you know, we, we've talked about a range of different type, type of research. Clearly, when you're looking at supple, you know, we're being driven initially by pretty much fundamental research, um, you know, the laws of physics and really challenging the standard model of physics right through to very applied things. So how what how do you balance, you know, particularly in terms of collaboration and operating research infrastructure, that balance between bleeding edge, leading edge, and and really and innovation opportunities that will translate down the line to, you know, future submarines or future mm -hmm. applications. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, that, it is a tough question, I think, in terms yeah. of in, infrastructure. And if I go to the submarine example first, and then walk away from it, um, if, everybody knows in the room that we're going down the nuclear path. Mm. Um, if we're going to be the owners and we understand those submarines, we've got to be really deep experts in that science and understand it, make sure we don't have an accident. Um, we used to have a substate boundary, it would be a nuclear boundary across the top of that. So we do need infrastructure to support the R&D in really deep science with deep technical expertise. And if we're investing in infrastructure to do that, it's relatively easy. We've got a long-term plan. Um, we can spend lots of time developing the infrastructure, using the infrastructure and getting the R&D that we need. On the other side of the equation, in defence, again, um, we've all heard that um, you know China is developing new technologies and applying them very, very quickly. We've seen it in the Ukraine. And um, this is where, um, within defence, all of the ideas and solutions don't come from within the department themselves. They come from the um, small, medium enterprises out there, industry. And they're very innovative, and we want solutions to latest problems mm. in a year and a half, maybe. And I want to demonstrate that as a minimum viable product on a warship now, instead of the gold plating one. So um, they might need support to this infrastructure as well mm. um, to demonstrate their ideas to prove to us that it can be done. Um, but unfortunately, if you're planning new infrastructure. You don't know what those ideas are. You don't know where they're going to come from. Mm. You can't collect them and put them in a business case to support it. Mm. And so when we're using the facilities at the end of the day, it's the longer term things that tend to win. But I think we've got to provide that environment now for these short term. Let's try it. Let's yeah. see it. If it doesn't work, you know, learn early, the design thinking approaches. Yeah. And, um, you know, We've got to rethink our culture around mm. facilities and how we use them and how we invest in them. Mm. You're failing is a reasonable outcome. Learning to try it. Don't learn fail it. fast. Yeah. Learn early. Learn early. It's a good one. Um, now, I'm doing a lousy job here on time, and we're probably just about out of time. Are we allowed one more question? Yeah, or is that it? Okay. Is, does, is, does anyone here have a, a question that they'd like to throw at our, our panel before we uh, close up? Maybe a so point to the panel. Um, thanks for the, for the presentation. Um, I think one of the themes that I am really keen to hear your views on is obviously each of you spoke about how the facilities enable the researchers and new fundamental science. Uh, how about collaboration between the research facilities themselves? For instance, you know, gathering a lot of data from the physical infrastructure, but then 
is the digital infrastructure adequate enough or is there enough collaboration that can happen between the research facilities to maximize value from what's already been invested? I think that's one of your path, Rosie. Yes. Um, so I think your question is very timely. Um, and the maturity of the research infrastructure system is now coming to that level. Mm. Um, and the the direction I would so it's it's signaled to government in the 2021 roadmap for research infrastructure in um, the the working across capabilities to achieve step changes is called out very very clearly. Um, what I would say is that we've got some really nice examples in the ARDC um, across different NQIS capabilities working together. So, for instance, the Australian Plant Phenomics Facility with BioPlatforms Australia, looking at phenomics and genomics of um, crops to improve the yield. Uh, we have another one with marine science. Um, the terrestrial ecosystems and the efforts of Living Australia coming together for the state of the environment reporting. What they have done is they have um, worked on the data assets to create the, the standards that enable integration, but it's just the first step because that was a point in time. Mm. What we need to do now is build that into a, a national system and expand it. So I think your, your question is just right on point with, with where we are as, as a nation right now. Thanks, thanks very much. I've got to draw this to a close while Sandra walks up very quickly, data, 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 aligning mindsets, um, I think is, is, is critical. Pl pl planning for, for known challenges, but being, available to solve short-term challenges and allow people to learn quickly. Um, I think, you know, and, and having that infrastructure supported for the long term are, are, are really key. Um, so all easy challenges to fix, I think, yeah, no problem. Yeah, so we just need to keep talking and, and selling that story uh, to those who are going to hand out the money. And yes, we are running over time, so I, um, which we're not supposed to do, but that's good. I think it's been a really fascinating presentation. I think we've all learned a lot about the scale at which this operates from my point of view uh, and the opportunities, and they need to maintain, ensure that we keep this infrastructure going through operational funding. Uh, in the interest of time, let me thank Sue, Peter, Rosie and Stuart for an excellent set of presentations with them and support. Uh, and certainly there's the opportunity to chat to them offline once we complete. Can I just also uh, allude to uh, our next presentation, our next seminar, which will be uh, in the first week of May, which will be a really interesting presentation on how we manage land. Uh, we have speakers presenting on that from an Indigenous perspective. Uh, so how would, how uh, our First Nations people have managed land, uh, as well as Richard Ecker talking about how it's done, complementing that and how it's done in a, a more modern way. So I think this will be a very exciting and interesting discussion and look forward to you joining us again then. But otherwise, we will finish there. So thank you again. Thank you. <laughs>